Thank you everybody for joining us here with Nolan Higdon and Mickey Ha for their presentation of their new book. Um, Toltstool is very appreciative that you all come to this presentation. Um, Nolan Higdon is a lecturer at Merrill College and the Education Department at University of California, Santa Cruz. And Mickey Huff is the director of Project Censored and president of the Nonprofit Media Freedom Foundation. And if you guys want to go ahead and take it away, then it's ready. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elise. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you to the whole crew there at uh, Toadstool Books, and, and thank you um, all of you for tuning in from wherever you are in the world. Um, it's great to see all of you. Um, I also want to thank our, our publisher, uh, Relage, and the whole team over there, Dean, Lewis, Akshita, and all the rest of the folks who, who made this possible. Um, thank you. Um, you know, I'll say off the, at the start, Mickey and I are both um, educators. We've been teaching through Zoom during the pandemic, um, so we've become very used to using the chat while teaching. So um, I don't want the chat to distract from our discussion today, but I, I promise you we'll be sharing links and things like that, and, and you're welcome to do the same. Um, you know, we hope to share resources and get to hear from all of you. Um, we plan to, you know, talk about our, our latest book, which we're here to talk about today, which is Let's Agree to Disagree. Um, a critical thinking guide to communication, conflict management, and critical media literacy for about 15, 20 minutes. Um, and then we really hope to open it up for um, Q&A so we can talk to all of you. Um, so that'll be the, uh, the plan today. And um, I guess I, I wanna start by kind of talking about why we wrote this, this book in this moment. Um, Mickey and I had written a, a book together called United States of Distraction in, in 2019. Um, Mickey writes for the annual censored book every year. And um, I wrote the anatomy of fake news in, in 2020. And um, whenever we write a book, we go out and our favorite part is always to do this. We love to do book talks. We love to come talk to all of you folks. And as Mickey and I kept um, comparing notes after the book talks, we kept getting the same comments and questions, which were, you know, we think your books are great. I totally understand the critiques of media. I totally understand your game plan for how to spot fake news. What I don't get though, is how do I talk to people who believe fake news or how do I talk to the other side? And we kept getting this question and Mickey and I thought, and this is a really fascinating question we're getting from people of all ages across the ideological spectrum. Um, and at the same time in our professional career, we kept hearing folks saying things like, we can't talk to this side or that side, or we can't reach these type of people. And we thought that these were this was really a, a, a level of discourse that, that ran against democracy, right? Democracy is predicated on this idea that of course we disagree, um, but we use the powers of persuasion and communication to try and build a coalition uh, to make the world a little more like we'd like it to be. Um, so we wrote this book to kind of make that case that um, there's a lot of research out there about um, the threats posed to democracy right now. Um, the, uh, various international research points out that democracy is in retreat right now. And so um, we sort of thought that one of the ways in which we could um, reverse that trend was by writing a book that sort of retaught one of the basic aspects of a democracy. That is that we have to communicate with each other. If you're a liberal, conservatives are not going to disappear. If you're a conservative, liberals are not going to disappear, right? Um, we have to be able to uh, communicate with one another. And hopefully with the goal of getting to understand people we disagree with, but also being able to change minds. And so that's what this book was really about. Um, let's agree to disagree, disagree can mean many, many different, different things, things. And we point that, that out in the text. You know, um, it can mean that we just need to walk away, walk away no, we'll no. never agree. Sometimes it means maybe we need to get together and actually disagree, because all we do is we, we argue against caricatures of each other. Um, Mickey and I had taught um, critical thinking and um, for quite a long time, longer than probably either of us want to remember. remember. And so we saw this as an opportunity to create a, a, a book that could be used in the classroom to promote critical thinking. But as part of, that, part of that process, also teaching students how to engage in dialogue with one another in a constructive way versus a destructive way. And so that was the genesis um, of the book. Um, 
And so um, I'm going to turn it over to, to Mickey now. who will talk about, start us on the conversation, talking about the three parts of the book um, that followed. Mickey? Oh, do we lose Mickey? I guess I'll talk about the first part of the book. Um, <laughs> um, so we, we broke the book up into three parts. Um, the first part is about communication, about how we can have constructive dialogue and what destructive dialogue looks like. The um, second part of the book focuses on critical thinking skills and how we can become more effective critical thinkers. And then the third part is about critical media literacy. Um, the third part of the book argues that um, much of what we use as evidence to, to shape our arguments or to make our case to each other are come from media. This can be things like news media or even just representations in entertainment media like film. So the goal of this text is to think about these sources we use and how they shape our perception of the world um, so we can better understand how we are justifying what we're communicating when we're in dialogue with people, whether we agree or disagree. Um, we made a we made a concerted um, a concerted effort throughout the text to bring in controversial issues from the headlines, but to bring them in in a way where students are and readers are encouraged to actually listen to or learn about the different sides on that issue. So this text has things in there about um, you know cancel culture, for example, which. Uh, is an often ill-defined term and used in a multitude of ways. We purposely bring in different voices um, on this issue of, of um, cancel culture, for example. Um, we also made a concerted effort to make sure that we had um, a vast range of identities represented throughout the text as well. So um, we didn't want to write one of those textbooks that says like, you know, theoretically, you all should be talking with each other because you disagree. And now we're going to go sit back in our ivory tower and work on the next book project. Um, we actually went out of our way to go find real world examples where folks are, are applying these principles in practice. Um, they range from, you know, we have politicians in there like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Um, we have pro sports players like um, Drew, B Drew Brees and Malcolm Jenkins are in there. Um, we have activists like the African-American activist um, Daryl Davis, um, some trans activists down in Florida, um, all these different sort of voices that are applying these principles um, so we can better understand um, uh, how to actually use them. And so, Mickey, I was going to turn it over to you to the first part of the book. I sort of went over the broad overview of three parts, but I, I see your back and I'll, I'll let you uh, jump in here now. Thanks so much, Nolan. And again, thanks for every uh, thanks everybody um, for the invitation and for hosting us here this evening. Um, sorry, I was having some bad internet connection stuff going on. So thanks for thanks for carrying the water, Nolan. Um, the we teach courses around this book actually. So the reason we wrote this book uh, is that we've been teaching critical thinking courses and critical media literacy courses, contemporary historiography courses. Um, we teach in different disciplines. And what we notice going out throughout all the areas where we teach is there seems to be a lack of application of simple critical thinking skills connected to communication skills, which include not just writing and speaking, but also listening and developing uh, empathy, skills like empathy. Empathy, having empathy is really a skill in many ways that needs to be practiced and honed. Um, and so Nolan and I you know, decided, that, as you heard, based on what we did in the United States of Distraction, um, people really wanted to have, have a book that instead of talking about how doomed we are for 200 pages and then having two paragraphs at the end that say, but wait, there's hope. Um, and then we don't outline it or we don't get to it um, and we don't really prescribe much, it kind of leaves people exhausted. Uh, and, it, and it also contributes to one of the big problems that we talk about, it, which is outrage culture. It, uh, we are nothing if not an outrageous culture here in the United States. Um, we really are grappling with historic levels of hyper-partisanship 
We are living in an era where the media landscape is, um, you know, really filled with toxic messages of all kinds. Um, it's really loud and noisy. It's hard to get words in edgewise. Um, no one mentioned cancel culture. That's something that's happening across the ideological spectrum. And I want to repeat one thing that, he, uh, that Nolan said is that we went out of our way to find uh, various examples, various people to uh, make far more diverse this textbook than only what are the experiences of each of us, right? And I, I teach at Diablo Valley College. So does Nolan. Nolan teaches a couple other places. It's a about 20,000 student community college. It's a main feeder school into UC Berkeley, UC Davis, um, San Francisco State in the Bay Area. Um, so, you know, we, we work with a diverse group of students, uh, with a lot of working class students. So we really work with an intersectional group of students. And one of the things that we notice in some of the current culture wars that go on in media is that while there's a lot of talk about diversity and equity and inclusion, um, there's not necessarily a lot of, of practice about what does it mean to be more intersectional, not just in the way we um, you know, sort of move about, move about the world, but you know, how do we see things? How do we communicate about things? How do, we, how do we learn the languages of other people, both literally and metaphorically? And so that's what we tried to do in this book is we tried to break it down into, into segments that we think are really digestible. And of course, we like mnemonic devices and things like that. We have a, throughout the whole book, we, we riff on the word critical. And to be critical is not to be negative. To be critical is to be aware of interrelated questions about things uh, around a certain topic. To be critical means to be curious and inquisitive. Um, and so we really ran with the critical idea all the way up through a conclusion that's called lead by example, democracy is not a spectator sport. So in this book, we really feel like we, we took the last chapter of our United States of Distraction book, which was called Make America Think Again. And we really kind of put it in, in here. And we do focus, um, I wanna say, we focus on nuts and bolts, critical thinking skills, we look at the history and context of the First Amendment and free expression, what it is and isn't, right? We talk about the challenges of difficult speech, hate speech. Um, we talk about how there are laws that govern these things, but they are murky and gray areas. It's important that we actually find these. Uh, it's, it's important that we find, um, find ways that to, to, to connect with each other, really, I think. And so what we did here is we talk about critical thinking in the beginning, we talk about how that applies to media and how we become more critical consumers, not passive consumers of media, and even encourage people to maybe be the media, right? And citizen journalism. Um, we talk about the importance of understanding, understanding theory, critical theory. That's something that's been in the news quite a, a lot late, lately, including um, at, at the Supreme Court nomination uh, hearings. Um, where we have some members of Congress holding up books um, that I don't think they've read. Um, and th it's, it's, this is part of the problem. This is like, a, a, again, to, to read this with a degree of political literacy, right? These are all connected. Um, this is kind of like a big campaign stop for the midterms where things are far less about the nomination and more about some kind of virtue signaling to bases. And critical race theory has been one of those issues. So Nolan and I wrote about this in the book. You know, we wrote very clearly, what actually is it and what is it not? What isn't it? <laughs> and how has it been used as a political weapon, often by people who don't understand it or don't know what it is, only to then have people on another side supporting it that also don't necessarily know what it is, <laughs> or at least where it came from. Um, and then we, you know, and then we dive into the weeds too of some of the major conflicts that we see happening in that circle, in, that we, in, in the scholarly circles around critical media literacy, I'm sorry, critical race theory. But we talk about how critical media literacy is an important component of understanding the way that that kind of debacle has unfolded in our culture, right? Once again, we're connecting a lot of these issues as we go through the text. And there's one issue that I wanna hit on and then give it back to Nolan um, to you know, kind of pick up this, this baton here. 
We also talk about importance of fallacies, fallacious thinking, cognitive biases. We talk about confirmation bias, Dunning-Kruger effect. If people understand implicit biases, cognitive biases, confirmation biases, then they can be more aware not only of detecting them in others, but routing them out in themselves. So one of the things that we get at here, riffing on the late great Thich Nhat Hanh too, is um, we, we remember that we're also responsible for, for what we put out into the world, as well as how we will perceive what's happening in the world. But we may not, of course, have control over how people perceive us. So understanding cognitive biases, understanding fallacies and avoiding them, and then connecting that to effective communication practices, constructive communication, not destructive communication. Um, our news is, uh, culture is based on a negative news cycle. It's one negative thing happening after another that feeds into the outrage culture. And there's not a lot of focus on solutions journalism. There's not a lot of focus on modeling what a constructive dialogue or argument looks like, not a fight, but an argument. And ask yourself how many, just in your own life every day, how many times do people conflate those words? I don't wanna argue with you. And, but they mean it's a fight, right? They think it's like throwing chairs at each other or something on, on cable TV um, or talking over each other. And, and we're very clear to say arguing is exchanging ideas. And we have the privilege of teaching in a classroom that's a construction zone for ideas that we want to model in the outside, in the real world, where it matters. But in order to do that, we have to be able to check the way we communicate. And I think a big part of communication, and I'm going to, this is going to be repetition, um, but, it, but it's meant to be repetition. Um, a big part of that is how well do we listen to one another? How well do we actually hear what others are saying? And we have a couple of great parts in one of uh, the chapters on listening. And I just want to very, very quickly quote this and turn it over to Nolan to maybe talk about some of the, the prescriptions we came up with, maybe get more into that. We want to ask, are we hearing the message? We have to decipher the meaning, recall what's being stated. Did we hear it right? Are we thinking critically about it? And then are we then trying to provide some kind of feedback and process, right? There's an order of things. And the philosopher Daniel Dennett in a book called Intuition Pumps and Other Tools for Thinking um, points out four ways that participants can demonstrate to each other that they are practicing active listening. Also something that we call in the book critical listening. We might even call it empathetic listening, right? One, attempt to re-express the other person's position so clearly and vividly and fairly that they might respond by saying, thanks, I wish I'd thought of putting it that way. <laughs> List any points of agreement, number two, especially if they're not matters of general or widespread agreement, right? Three, mention anything that you might have learned from this other person, right? That's key. Building bridges, not walls, right? And the last is only then are you permitted, permitted or should you say, uh, anything critical, or should you have a rebuttal, right? So you're setting the stage for having the other party actually do what you're doing, which is listening. And before you say that, I can't talk to that Trumper across the street. I can't talk to that uh, blue, any, uh, blue no matter who. Um, before we start saying that and slipping into those, those, I'd say, easy because they're familiar positions, Take a look at people that we wrote about in the book, like Daryl Davis, the African-American activist who went and spoke with members of the Ku Klux Klan about why they were racist and white supremacists, Daryl Davis, an African-American. And he collected some 200 of their hoods and uniforms of people one by one that through dialogue, through critical thinking, by analyzing context, power structures, history. People aren't born with these bigoted ideas. They can be taught differently. And so here's somebody that went out and did it. And here's somebody that has evidence that it might be worth trying. Now we're not suggesting that people should be forced to try. There are certainly people in marginalized communities or vulnerable positions 
where they don't feel safe to do that. And that has to be recognized. But we then have to talk about why that is and how do we get a space where these grievances or these concerns or these arguments can be carried forward and how can we help each other to do those things. We're not condoning abuse. We're not telling people to go and put yourself in a horrible situation where you'll be attacked by some misogynistic or racist person. What we're saying though is we do need to make effort to find out how where do we see those paths? Where do we see those opportunities? And how do we choose when it's, it's worth our time and effort? And again, we all choose different things at different times for different reasons. And we, that, the good thing is, is if we all engage in these kind of behaviors, some of us get to pass off that baton to continue with that, right? And say like, I'm, I need to sit this one out while you take care of this issue here. You know, these are kind of strategies that we talk about too in the final chapter, when we talk about what does it mean, let's get critical and each of the letters of the word critical stands for a certain thing that we talk about in the book. So with that, I wanted to turn things back over to Nolan and obviously address anything else in the book that you think is germane here to the conversation. And then of course we want to get to some of the prescriptions. For sure, yeah, thank you, Mickey. Um, yeah, I'll pick up where Mickey, Mickey left off. Um, I guess where the book starts and then I'll turn to where the book ends the, this uh, final chapter where it kind of puts together all the different things we've, the different arguments we've made in the book into one final chapter. Um, uh, the book is really predicated on this idea that if you live in a democracy and you want your democracy to last, it's a 24 hour a day job. So I know sometimes we get, we hear from folks that they say, well, I'm tired of talking about this or I'm tired of dealing with this. And, and, I think the stories of Daryl Davis, um, some of the, the trans activist folks in particular, I find quite inspiring that they keep pushing, keep fighting, keep making changes. Uh, we bring in historical voices of people who kept fighting as well. I always like to bring up, um, you know, Frederick Douglass. I'm sure, you know, Douglass was tired after he was trying to learn how to read in secret and more tired when he beat up a slave breaker and more tired when he escaped slavery and more tired when he almost died being an abolitionist speaker and getting murdered, more tired when he sent his children off to fight in the Civil War where they could be killed. I'm sure he was really tired, but until I you know, make that kind of level of impact, I'm not gonna say I'm tired. Um, there's a lot of work that can be done um, in a democracy. Um, and so the, the text um, you know, serves multiple functions. One is um, we hope it's an opportunity to be self-reflective first. Um, so this isn't a text about attacking like those who can't critically think. It's about asking the reader to kind of reflect on their own practices. Um, so do I have evidence to, you know, support my view? Um, when I talk about other people, am I talking about the actual people or am I talking about a caricature that makes me feel comfortable talking about them? Um, am I listening to the other side or have I already made up my mind? And so I'm just, you know, hearing what they're saying. So I'm waiting for my turn to speak back. Um, we also hope that it'll inspire people to reach out to those they disagree with, um, to have constructive dialogue. So interrogate from a place of love, if you will. Um, sometimes just some simple questions um, can help people critically think. So if someone, you know, makes an argument or, or makes a, tells you about a story they heard that you think is probably false, one of the best ways to just respond is like, I've never heard that before. You know, where did you get that story? Um, do you know what evidence they have for that? I'm like interested in this to show a general like curiosity um, to make this person kind of reflect like, do I do I have evidence for what I'm saying right now? Or am I just sort of repeating what I think I know? Um, and that can be a way to get people to learn without, you know, um, turning the dialogue destructive. And we talk about what destructive dialogue is in the book. If you really want to change minds or reach someone you disagree with, it's as important to know what to do as it is important to know what not to do. Um, name calling, lampooning them, mocking them, um, those kinds of things tend not to change minds too effectively. Um, and then lastly, I guess I would say also one of our other hopes of the book is that um, we really do hope that um, educators adopt the book into the classroom. Um, you know, our, we think that the Classroom space is a very important space. Um, you know, it's one of the, the few spaces we still have left where we're able to talk openly. And we'd like to use that space not as a place to preach to the choir or to um, come up with a homogenous view, but encourage students to engage in, in dialogue, especially during COVID, you know, two years of this, students, you know, have really had limited social interaction. 
Um, so learning these basic skills that, that conflict is, is a part of life and it's a good thing when, when managed correctly um, is an important lesson that I hope educators will teach and we can all um, learn. So I'll close in saying that the final chapter is, as uh, Mickey noted, we, we break down the word critical across the chapters and, and we have these sort of eight, um, uh, eight recommendations at the end. Um, the C is for create um, constructive dialogue. The R is for reflect on communication practices. The I is for inquire, that is be a critical thinker. The T is for testing theory and spotting ideology. Um, the I is for investigating and evaluating mass media. Mass media. Um, the C is for critiquing content. That's mostly focused on fake news and journalism. Um, the A is for assess, analyze, and evaluate digital media use and abuse. We talk a lot in the book about ways we can ways we can change what we do with digital tools that will radically change our lives and our connections with people um, in the text. And then the L, um, and I think this is more most important, is lead by example. Democracy is not a spectator sport. Um, a lot of the times when we're telling others what they should be doing, uh, we could be looking in the mirror and considering what we ought to be doing. So with that, um, we wanna open it up for the um, Q&A portion. I thank you all for, for listening. Um, to our review of the book, and we look forward to chatting with all of you. Thank you. Uh, and we to discuss things that came up in the book. Um, you know, have a couple other passages might want to share as well, but uh, definitely just rather hear from from you all. Thoughts, questions, comments. And Elise, are you uh, moderating the uh, Q and A, Liz? Hi, uh, my name is Liz. I live here in New Hampshire and I'm very active with the League of Women Voters. And that puts me in the state house uh, where I'm frequently testifying on election law. About two months ago, there was a bill that came up that brought out hundreds of supporters of the stop the steal, the big lie, you know, that, that point of view. Uh, to a hearing. They wanted to do a complete recount of the 2020 election. And uh, they wanted also to get rid of all ballot counting machines so that we would only do hand counting because you can trust people more than machines was their point of view. So I had my testimony ready. I'd signed up to testify and I'm in this we, we were meeting in the state house uh, chamber, the legislative chamber, it was huge. <laughs> And they were not masked. They were not sitting in the unmasked section. In short, I was frightened. So you're talking about finding, uh, you know, people being tired of the fight. At that point, I was downright scared. And I kept thinking, as soon as the chair calls on me and lets me speak, I'm getting out of here. I was scared because of COVID. I was scared of them. They were uh, being rude, they were being loud, they were not behaving the way we normally behave in the state house. Mm -hmm. And it was a revelation to me how frightened I was. So I don't know if you deal with that in your book. Do you deal with the fact that being just in close proximity to people with radically different views and ways of behaving is frightening enough to make me not want to talk to them at all. I didn't want to be there, you know. I, I stayed until almost the end. I gave my testimony, and it was the first time I ever left and then called home to my husband and say, have a, have a big margarita waiting for me. I'm going to need it tonight. So I'll, well, Liz, I'll stop talking and like to hear what you have to say about that. <laughs> well, Liz, I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that story, and I'm glad that you're, you're Okay, um, yeah. I want to thank you for the work you do with the League of Women Voters, um, an incredible organization. We work with them on our campus as well. Um, you know, I uh, just brought this up the other day. I want to get to what you said, but um, I think things were a lot better off when the League of Women Voters were running the presidential debates. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Before <laughs> by the corporate parties behind it. Because take a look, you know, this divisiveness in our political culture, it's been there, but it's, as Nolan and I write both in this book and our previous book, 
We have become extraordinarily hyperpartisan and our media silos have become smaller and our echo chambers louder. So these groups of people and you're describing, you know, you're, you're kind of putting yourself in one camp de facto and you're talking about these other people and you, you hit on two things for me that I thought were pretty profound. One was, I mean, again, there's definitely the other, the other isms, right? These folks unmasked, QAnon, et cetera, they see you as the other, right? right? And so again, that's why we're saying, okay, this is the hyper-partisanship thing. This is what media have done to drive a wedge into the country and exploit it to the hilt. The word that you said that resonated with me most was fear. Fear is an incredibly powerful emotion. And it really, and when we get in those situations, the fight or flight mode kind of kicks in and it starts to take over, uh, you know, how, what we do next. And I would submit that a lot of the people that were in that chamber were already in that mode on the other side, <laughs> right? Yes. They're fearful that you're taking something from them. And, but notice that this is all driven by media propaganda, censorship of factual information, and people not being able to think critically and independently about the information they have at their disposal and they're not processing it critically. This is all rooted in a lack of critical thinking and a lack of critical media literacy and a lack of modeling it in our educational institutions and in our news and information disseminating institutions, which is coming back to the reason that we wrote this book. <laughs> the irony of course, is that it's an academic book that is pretty academic because it's kind of moot. People don't buy $40 textbooks. Thank you, Rutledge. Um, but we do thank Dean and the Rutledge team. They are fantastic for, for helping us get this out. They've been great. I only wish <laughs> that it could be more available to people who actually would benefit from it. So I would at least like to go back and, and as part of this, which may sound somewhat like a non-answer to you, but I, I want to acknowledge clearly that I recognize and respect your um, depiction and your feelings about what was happening at that time. And then I wanna go back and say, is there, is there a way, it sounds like in that situation, there was not a way, but is there a way in another format where these competing sort of ideas that if you were to be, to be generous, um, is there a way that we can find a root issue, right? Because you know, it wasn't that long ago that Democrats were really interested in election integrity issues. When, when did that evaporate? We still have problematic elections. We still have voter suppression. We, I mean, so, and I know that that's not what Stop the Steal is saying. But my point is, is that you see that there's a road there. There's a road that when, when Democrats were upset about the system being broken, the Republicans didn't care. And now the Democrats don't seem to care the other way around. My point there is that that approach is going to just continue until we have responsible people enter into the, the realm and start like journalists, for example, have the power to do that and start setting the tone and not accept people going off and spouting nonsense for, for five minutes, but by saying, where's your evidence for that? Where did you get that information? Can you point it to me so that I can have a chance to evaluate it also? And then by the way, here's a raft of other people and courts and decisions and judges that have investigated all of these claims and said that there's not much there. How do we get into having that conversation? I don't know all the answers, Liz. I just know that we have to do this somehow or else more people are going to have happened to them what happened to you, which is terrible. It's a terrible thing to be made to feel afraid and, and feel almost like marginalized in your own community, that you've been kind of taken over by mob rule. And yeah. quite literally in some senses. Yeah. But I also, and this is the empathy part, this is the hard part, this is the Thich Nhat Hanh part. How do you get in to talking with people, you obviously can't do it in that circumstance, 
But afterwards, look, I have one of these people that lives next door to me. I know what you're talking about. I see them on campus. I see them in my community. But I can't be screaming over the fence every day. It's not healthy. It's not palatable. It's not sustainable. So if I want to try to have a peaceful existence, partly I have to try to figure out how I do that but notice that this is where we run into the challenges of how do we convince other people that they should be doing it too? <laughs> and I say that as a real honest, serious challenge. And I don't have all the answers, but Nolan and I did talk about a couple of examples in the book. And I'm gonna go back to media again because it's the media that blows the opportunity and exacerbates this at every turn. Remember Malcolm X said, if you aren't careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people who are being oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing. We kind of see versions of that going on every day in one sphere or another in our lives. And I'm reminded by the Native American elder, Nathan Phillips, and the Covington, Kentucky high school kids at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. a few years ago, where there was a confrontation between these MAGA hat young white kids from a conservative school in Ohio and a Native American act activist. And according to the media, there was a showdown. And of course they immediately went to the frame of the right wing Christian uh, kids attacking the Native American man. And of course it fits a narrative, right? That the media was all over. It turns out in that case that that's not actually what was happening. And I don't know how many people followed this case, but Nick Sandman, the young man in the, in the picture, the famous pictures, he won multi-million, hundred million dollar lawsuits for defamation because the media basically screwed up the entire story and defamed him falsely. I know that's hard for people to wrap their heads around because they already have a preconceived notion of what they think they saw there. But after that case went to, went after it was litigated and after the facts were known outside of the media framing and then the media had egg on its face and had to mea culpa again, um, we have to kind of go back and revisit ourselves as to, well, why was I so moved at that time? Why was I so cocksure that I knew what was ha happening? Remember media. The power of media is so extraordinary. And this is what we do at Project Censored. We analyze media, the news that doesn't make the news and why. We amplify underreported independent alternative news stories, especially that are voices of people from marginalized communities because we have to understand what's happening. And we know that the top-down managed news corporate establishment press does not do that well or consistently. And so we kind of have multiple challenges happening at the same time, which is again why this book fuses them together because it's as if we can't do one without doing the other and expect to have some type of reasonable positive outcome. And I know that's a long-winded way of not exactly answering your question, but I'm not being coy about it either. I honestly think that when we talk about these things out loud, that's when, we, that's when we really start to understand and strategize and rethink, well, what could I do differently? And what could I suggest to someone else? And if that happened again, what might I do differently or what might I do the same? Or I'd like to not ever have that happen again. How do I prevent that from happening again? <laughs> Mickey, Mickey I'll, uh, yeah, I'm going to jump in. I'm going to jump in real quick, and because uh, I want to make sure get some other questions in. And Liz, I do want to. Um, I don't want to ignore your question. I, I want to get a couple other folks in, but I'll answer um, kind of two small areas. One is that the feeling you you expressed there, which I I too am sorry you uh, had to go through, and I thank you for sharing. Um, we have a study in the opening of the book um, that that came out. I think it was late last year. That Americans' number one fear is now other Americans. Yeah. And, um, and our, you know, the point we make with that is, you know, one, a, a democracy is not sustainable when we fear each other, but also um, uh, there's, there are clear differences, but media does amplify some of these fears. And that's not to say that's in your case, but you asked if we like address this issue of fear. 
and we do we do address that issue of um, when we're constantly seeing characters of each other who are displayed as like evil on our, our news media and what meanwhile our views are championed as the good guy views. Um, we really do get like a unfair sense of the world and we, specifically in the digital media chapter we talk about how social media tools amplify those differences um, by confirming our bias about ourselves and these characters. So I, pre I really do um, appreciate it, Liz. I'm gonna let a couple other folks jump in here, but thank you thank for sharing you very much, the work you do. We do actually have um, one thing from somebody. Um, they said two things. A thought, even the ghastly stuff may be good in the very long run because it's better than hiding. And then their question is, how does your rational approach to, how does your rational approach apply to topics that are particularly weighty for want of a better word, like race and physical abuse, how can you listen to the other side or agree to disagree about them? Nolan? Yeah, we. Uh, it's a great. It's a great question, and, it, and it's one we we wrestled with um, as we wrote the text. Um, we we blend um, different approaches to knowledge in the text. So we have the rationalist approach in there that you mentioned, um, but we also go into the critical school of theory and how um, power shapes what constitutes knowledge um, and how this has been used to, to perpetuate um, racism and white supremacy and other, other hateful ideology. So we, we do talk about that in the text. We also talk about how let's agree to disagree can mean multiple things. So it, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, you need to go out and um, hear out a racist point of view um, and you know treat it with like as if it's an equal compelling argument. Um, but the, the text does encourage folks to, uh, if one of their goals is to combat or mitigate um, racist attitudes and behaviors, to think about how dialogue might be a tool used um, to achieve those goals. But we in no way think that um, individuals are supposed to put themselves in oppressive situations and, and be oppressed. That's not what the book talks about. That would fall under the, like it does talk about that as a topic, but it doesn't advocate for it. Um, as a topic that falls under what we talk about as destructive dialogue. Um, if part of um, constructive dialogue depends upon reciprocity. So if you're engaging in constructive dialogue with someone who refuses to listen, uh, refuses to self-reflect, um, refuses to respect you or treat you with decency, there's only so much that that, that dialogue can go. So we, we don't advocate for constructive dialogue. We advocate for people to amplify constructive dialogue. Uh, Mickey, do you wanna add anything to that? No, it's a, it's a great, um, it's a really important question, a great question. And it is something we grappled with. And Nolan and I, of course, are also mindful that we're two white males and in academia, I, I wouldn't call it a, an elite uh, kind of academia, as you heard me talking about community college earlier, but we're well aware of the various privileges we have. We don't ignore them. Um, one thing we do is, is we do try to use any of that that we have to curry listenership, to um, try to mediate if possible. Um, but this is also why we researched widely and diversely this isn't just Nolan and I talking in the book. We went out and found very intersectional people, very different background with very different backgrounds, very different identities, social, political, and cultural identities that have experience in the things that we're talking about and that are experts in the areas that we're talking about. And we, they're doing the talking, right? This is again, a, the, the book is a, it, the book itself is kind of a conversation between us and all of these other people that we've gotten to know and respect and we teach their work, right? Um, and so kind of the way we went about writing the book is, is what we hope the book conveys to people. And we do hope that it helps, but I wanna be very clear that um, some of the kind of conversations that you just brought up um, are not just difficult, but there are certain times when they can't happen. And we have to address that as well. And I think we have to work to create spaces where difficult things can not just be said, but heard. And unfortunately, sometimes that does mean it needs to go three ways, four ways, eight ways. There's not just two ways. And this is where things get complicated and nuanced rather than binary. 
Instead, most of the way that news frames and packages all the things happening, it's this or that, it's one or the other, it's black or white. Um, you're either pro US involvement with Ukraine or you're pro Putin. Um, I mean, these would be laughable if they weren't so cartoonishly dangerous because it leads people to conclusions not based on evidence, but knee jerked on emotional responses from media messaging. So we got to go back to the, you know, who's role modeling our discourse? Who's doing that in our society? If it's the leaders in the Democratic and Republican Party, and if it's the cable news people, we're in a lot of trouble uh, because they're not really setting the bar very high. And I think it's up to us to let them know that that very issue itself is unacceptable. And until we address that, we won't be able to address anything else. Yeah. Uh, I have two quick things. Well, they're not quick, but one is you talked a lot about the media. Uh, so I wonder what your thoughts are about the uh, fact checker organizations. Um, and also the other question I have is that you know, in having some of these discussions with other folks about differences of opinion, one of the major issues I've run up against is people, especially around issues like abortion, that there is a lot of belief. It's not really facts behind the situation, but people believe certain things, especially based on religion, uh, but sometimes other things as well. So anyway, your thoughts on those two things. Just, just real quick, I wanted to say something about the latter, and I know Nolan's going to say uh, pretty much what I would say about the former, about the so-called fact checker sites, um, you know, who's watching the watchers. But as to um, the second, again, um, that's kind of what we mean by the let's agree to disagree element is, is if we can get a, like, like abortion, what we often end up having is people speaking very different languages or speaking about different values ranked in different orders about an allegedly same topic, right? Um, and just the way that the language is even around things like abortion is so-and-so is pro-life. Well, does that mean someone, that implies someone's pro-death? Um, uh, so-and-so is pro-choice. Well, you, know, you see what I mean with the wording, right? Just the way that people word or brand with wording shows how they're kind of prioritizing values. And we may hold the same values. We may value life and choice, but when it comes to X, I value life and choice, you value choice and disagree about the definition of life. So we, we do have to get into the details of where does the belief kick in, right? Where does that belief kick in? Where does the factual road end? Mark Twain, get your facts first and you can distort them as much as you please. <laughs> uh, where does the road end and where does the belief begin? And then when the belief begins, it's okay, I understand that you believe in this value so strongly, but that doesn't negate the facts that I brought up to your belief, the gate of your belief. And sometimes that means that's where the conversation stops or pauses. Um, but that very issue itself becomes the subtopic or sub, sub conversation because until you figure out how to manage the language and, the, and what the beliefs and biases already are, you, you got to like get into that. You got to actually get into that conversation. And then you're not even talking about abortion anymore. You're talking about something else. But I think it's really important to have those conversations as, not, as simultaneously as possible or as side by side as possible so that there's a, there's a way in which that there might be at least some understanding of each other's positions, if not agreement. Nolan? Uh, yeah, Kathleen, thank you for your, your question. I'll, I'll uh, jump to the first, the first question you had. Um, I think Mickey took care of the second one. Um, yeah, fact checker websites, um, since, this, since the moral panic over fake news, um, there's been a lot of people who've had like silver bullets or easy solutions, right? We'll make a list of good news outlets versus bad news outlets. This, these people fact check, we'll have a truth meter. Um, not, only am I, not only have some of these things been proven wrong, um, I'm suspicious of giving up my critical thinking skills to some entity that operates in secret and how it determines fact from fiction for me. Um, I really do believe in, at the individual level, we need to be the ones making these determinations. We can't put it in the hands of shadowy organizations. 
And some of these things like NewsGuard, for example, are who do that, who do similar work to what you described. Um, their, their board is full of people like who are anti-educator, like Arnie Duncan, um, ex-members of the intelligence community, um, corporations, you know, folks who've had a long history of perpetuating false information are now telling me what is true. That, 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 that sort of relationship um, frightens me. So I would, I would argue that, you know, you should largely stay away from them. However, um, I do go to them often because I use them as a starting point. So if there's some issue and I know nothing about it, I like, or I just, I haven't followed this story. I go to the fact-checking websites because usually they'll have links to other stories. So I can kind of start to get an idea of what the narrative around that story has been from different outlets, but I do not rely solely on them or trust their conclusion. Um, to me, that that's sort of uh, antithetical to education and, and threatening to democracy. And notice too, the weaponization of fake news as a phrase has gradually been morphing into a catch-all word, misinformation. And let's remember misinformation and disinformation are technically different things. Propaganda is also a different thing. Some propaganda is perfectly true and factual. It just may not be complete or whole. Um, and so the ways in which that we are now allegedly relying on these third party shadowy organizations, I'm gonna use that word again with dubious conflicts of interest, like the Atlantic Council is the PR arm of NATO. So when, and they're fact checking at Facebook, so when I see Facebook telling me a story about the Russia-Ukraine conflict that's happening right now is flagged as Russian media or Russian disinformation, I'm not just going to automatically believe Facebook or the Atlantic Council. I'm sorry. Um, I wasn't born yesterday. And the first casualty of war is truth. And that's a great example of looking at it. The deplatforming and canceling of views coming out of Russia it, it, in other words, becoming more authoritarian, like Putin, you know, we should be opening media and opening dialogue and arguing with positions and fact checking them, not asking third party corporate elites and people with government connections and think tank connections to do it. But where are the journalists doing it? Right? Where is that happening in that space? And that's why, like Nolan said, I think these are really useful. But as I tell my students, I think Snopes is for dopes. Because if you just go there and you believe Snopes, it's no different than just going and believing Fox or CNN. You, got, you can't outsource and get away from doing the re real critical thinking and fact checking and work yourself or building relationships with groups or people who you grow to trust because you know they do. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, Anybody else? I'm gonna butcher this name, is it Yuya? Uh, thank you. Um, I'll, I haven't read the book, but I'll definitely do. Um, I, I'll get it right away. Um, the title, um, Let's Agree to Disagree, um, kind of reminds me of Chantal Mouffe's argument of the agonistic democracy and how the disagreement, the dissensus is the kind of, um, it, it is the dissensus that enables the plural, plural pluralism and um, so on. Um, so um, I um, I agree to disagree. Um, um, my I wonder what you think about. So it's not like sometimes uh, these days it looks mm -hmm. like maybe it's not new, but um, it's not within the democratic state that. Um, so sorry, I'll, I'll try to articulate. I recognize the, uh, the importance of disagreements uh, for the operation of democracy, active exercise of democracy within the state, but um, we see a lot of foreign, foreign players uh, who benefit from the disagreements within the democratic state. So um, different countries send propagandas and kind of fuel the disagreements. Um, in order to polarize the society and kind of implode the democratic nations from within. Um, so I wonder if your book addresses that kind of international relationship, or uh, if not, I, I want, I, I'm curious to hear what you think about uh, those aspects. Thank you. Oh yeah, thank you very much for that um, question. Uh, That's great. Yeah, um, this is something we've, we've done in our previous books for sure, and we have in this book as well. Um, where one of the um, 
information sources, both for factual and false, comes from uh, international sources, sometimes pernicious actors, sometimes well-meaning actors. Um, uh, and to your point, yeah, sometimes the goal is to get um, disagreement, but uh, I would argue it's, it's in a very um, specific way, uh, disagreement that's destructive. So destructive dialogue, um, not constructive dialogue is what they try and foster. And I think this gets back to where, where Liz was um, bringing us to initially, which is if you, if you pound people with fear and misrepresentations of other people in their country, and you can get a nation to fear its, itself, um, that's how you really can demobilize a country from, from making any sort of sustained effort or growth or being strong. Um, and so it, it's a difficult um, balancing act as an individual to rise above the fear. You know, these, these are scary messages and um, information that's being lobbed at folks. So to rise above it and to say, to, to test yourself, like, is this really, are other people in the country really like this? Or is this a caricature? Um, or is my social media feed only giving me information that confirms this view um, and those sorts of things? And then I would, I would also say, I would take solace in the fact that um, uh, as long as, as I'm aware, um, of, since the nation states have existed, other nations have tried to lob false information into nation states. So this isn't a new problem. Um, this is something democracies have been able to live with and mitigate in the past. And, and I think we're, we're capable as long as we recognize and react properly to the challenge. And I would just add very quickly to that, that whatever people claim RT America was, um, you know, we knew several people that worked there. We were on programs there. Abby Martin was there for years with Breaking the Set. By the way, the archives of all of that is gone. It's just been memory hold, right? Um, so people can't access that. And so my point here is that rather than have censors telling us that we can't have this media source today and we have to have a Ukrainian mule, not a Moscow mule tomorrow, hello, Freedom Fries, um, we need to be critically media literate. We need to broaden our, our menu and our diet and know what we're putting in. We, we don't want to see that happen. We don't need to see uh, censorship of critical views. And yes, it, it, was it true that a lot of views on RT were critical of US policy? Yes. Were they falsely critical of US policy? Mostly not. Not with Lee Camp or Chris Hedges or Abby Martin. Why can't they? Chris, Chris Hedges is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist from the New York Times. Why can't he get on CNN? Those are bigger questions that, that I, I'm reminded of when I, when I hear sort of the fear of foreign meddling or foreign press. By the way, we have our own Voice of America. We have our own outlets where we do this in other parts of the world and in Eastern Europe that are basically the same things in reverse as Nolan rightly pointed out, that this isn't new. This isn't a new thing. And what we argue is that rather than censorship, we argue that people need to be more critically media literate. They need to be more thoughtful. They need to understand better and they need to actually have historical context, right? Gore Vidal once called us the United States of amnesia. I would submit that it isn't so much that we forget things, it's that many of us don't know them in the first place. And the longer into the past it goes, the more and more likely it is to go into a memory hole. So I agree, these are really challenging times. And I think we need to be careful not to get caught up in the hyper-partisanship of the day when the result is a power, whether it's private, unaccountable YouTube saying, I can't see this stuff anymore, or whether it's our own government. And by the way, it's equally wrong in Russia, the way Putin has closed down, shut down journalism, threatened people with 15 years prison time for talking about invasion and war. That's absolutely abominable behavior, and it should not be tolerated. But it's both and, it's not either or, right? And that's what this our book again tries to help give us the tools so we can better have those kinds of complicated conversations and not just immediately make assumptions and retreat to our, our, our positions. I appreciate that question a lot, by the way. And everyone, it's been, uh, it's been really great hearing from you all. Anybody else wanna jump in? Anybody wanna disagree with us? <laughs> You'll see in the chat, I linked to our radio program, the Project Censored Show, um, and Nolan's all, all along the line podcast. He has another book out now, Podcaster's Dilemma on Podcasting Culture, Decolonizing Podcasters. 
Um, we talk about these issues on our show every week. So if anybody's interested, you want to contact us or send us ideas for the program or people that you think would be good to cover, please send them. And please feel free to contact us and send us any questions, comments, review copies, exam copies. A lot of the work we do is housed at projectcensored.org for free. And so we really encourage people to take advantage of that. We also have a, a media literacy book that's free online at the Global Critical Media Literacy Project, gcml.org. It's a few years old, but there's a free educator's resource guide over at this website with media uh, literacy resources. I'm just gonna put that in the chat really quickly. And again, you know, encourage you to take the opportunities to get this kind of information, give it to people you know in your community. If any of you are teachers or no teachers or students, feel free to share, share this with them. And if you'd like us to talk in some other community setting or another workshop or come to your school, let us know. We're always happy to do that. And we really enjoy talking about these issues. And more than anything, we really appreciate hearing what you think about these challenges we face and what best to do about them. So we really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and yeah, Mickey shared most of the links. Also show, um, I'm part of a uh, mass media lit um, which is right there in your backyard, Massachusetts. And um, well, at least here on the West Coast, we think everything's in your backyard, you tell me. Um, but Mass Media Lit does a lot of work with um, Massachusetts, uh, sorry, does a lot of um, teacher trainings across the nation, not just Massachusetts, um, but for folks who um, you know, are looking for community talks, looking for um, folks to do educator trainings, contact Mass Media Lit. Um, that work's done, you know, part of a nonprofit organization too. Um, I want to thank you all for for um, coming out today. I want to thank you thank you for your questions. Me and Mickey, every time we're writing the book, we talk about how fun it is to get out and hear from people and hear stories. Um, so we we look forward to that. And I want to thank one more time Toadstool Bookshop. Been a big supporter of our work. Um, always makes it a, uh, any opportunity they can to promote our work. So thank you so much, everybody at Toadstool, for supporting our work. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you guys again for coming and enjoying this with us. Um, yeah, I'll post a link again to the book in the chat room if you guys wanted to head over to the indie bookstore and make a purchase and support the authors. That'd be great. All right. Yeah, please support your local independent bookstores. Try not to buy from Amazon and <laughs> good luck out there. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you again, Elise. Take care, everyone.